COVID-19 cases in Nevada are finally starting to level off after a summer of escalating worries about the Delta variant. Are enough people getting vaccinated to thwart another wave? The state is about to get billions in federal dollars. Now state officials want you to weigh in on where that money should be spent. The eviction moratorium is back in place for now, but questions remain about whether it applies to renters in Nevada. And more people are saying I do after delaying their 2020 wedding plans and Las Vegas wedding chapels are cashing in. Support for Nevada Week is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt and additional supporting sponsors. After months of watching the number of COVID-19 cases climb, some recent metrics show cases are leveling off somewhat. But Clark County reached a grim milestone this week. Southern Nevada Health District reported that more than 5,000 people in Clark County have died due to COVID-19. Now, the Health District also announced that nearly 300,000 cases of COVID-19 have been reported in the U.S. There, it's more than 600,000 people reported dead from COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. Well, joining us to talk about Southern Nevada's progress on vaccination rates are Cecilia Alvarado with me, Familia Vota, and Christina Madison with Roseman University. Welcome, both of you. We really appreciate you being here again on the show. Um, some very encouraging news, test positivity rates going down, but at the same time, maybe some discouraging news where we still haven't reached our vaccination benchmarks that we were supposed to reach over two months ago. Cecilia, I want to start with you. What's, what's, what stands out to you on, on, on the data and where we are? Uh, my first impression is we're getting there. We're getting there. Any progress that we make, we're better off than when we were two weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, I think that as we are progressing, we're also learning. And so this is helping us you know, improve and do better as, as the days go back in, in, in the weeks. Mm. Christina, let's talk to you about this. We had you on the show, it was about a month ago. Uh, yeah. We were in a different position then. We saw the rises <laughs> happening, but it was, it was just kind of in those first stages now. One of the things we talked about with you is the amount of outreach that was being done at that time. And then of course, that, that we need to go to this next level of, of outreach, which was really going door to door here. I mean, what are you seeing? And what stands out to you on the progress that Ceci is mentioning here? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the biggest thing is that fear is a motivator. Mm. So Delta, I think, has really helped ramp up vaccine efforts. Um, I mean, we had tons of pop-ups available. People just weren't going to them, right? At this point, we know that um, pretty much every American lives within five miles of a place that they can get vaccinated, which is incredible if you think of that, right? And as a public health advocate, it, it makes me smile. Yeah. But it also is a little bit sad because people aren't utilizing these amazing tools that we have and these deaths that you just mentioned are completely preventable. Yeah. And so again, I think as Sissy uh, just mentioned, um, you know, we are doing better, right? And that progress is key, yeah. but we need to do more. Are you, I mean, but let's go back to those events that were you, a lot of incentives, you know, bands and, and, you know, celebrities and things like that going. I mean, have you, because of the fear, have you seen a change in the amount of activity, the amount of number, number of people that are getting vaccinated now? Yeah, we definitely have seen an uptick, um, but not quite as much as we would really like, right? Mm -hmm. So we're still at like right at 50% for fully vaccinated and about 60% for partially vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And now that we're seeing recommendations coming from the CDC for possibly giving a third dose to the immunocompromised and potentially a now booster dose being needed for people who were back vaccinated back in December of 2020 and January of this year, um, we need to get the people who haven't even started vaccinated, right? Like that's the key. Um, and that's why Delta came, right? Was because we still had a vector for this virus to mutate and change. Yeah. And what we don't want is for the virus to outsmart our vaccine. Big concern here. And then that is a big concern of if we continue with where we are with our vaccination rate, that we could see other variants beyond Delta. Is that correct? Absolutely. We're already seeing Lambda and some other ones as well in yep. some other countries. Yep. We'll get back to the booster in just a second. Ceci, I want to talk to you. We've had you on the show before to talk about census. We've had Mi Familia Vota on also to talk about 
get out the vote and registering voting, particularly in the Latinx community. And now you've taken a lot of that work and you've put it towards getting the uh, Hispanic community vaccinated. What are you seeing? Are you seeing a better response over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, absolutely. Mi Familia Vota launched, um, we launched our campaign in the, the beginning of June. And what we expect it to be a very s small campaign and focused in just education. But as we were knocking on those doors, um, we are also learning the challenges that our communities are facing. Um, where it's not just that I don't want to get vaccinated. Our question to our communities when we're knocking on the doors, what can we do to help you? Mm. What can we do for you to get vaccinated? Yeah. Uh, what are the challenges that you're facing? And so collecting their own data and, and coming back and reassessing our own programs, but having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with our community, going into their homes, knocking on their doors, and letting them know that we are here to support has actually been key to get a lot of our Latinx community, especially in the East Las Vegas, vaccinated. And what are you finding? Let's talk about some of those challenges then. Um, that you, I mean, there's no more boots on the ground than what you're talking about here. What are some of the, the challenges and concerns you're, you're confronting? Well, you know, the main concern that people have is the lack of access of health care. Mm -hmm. uh, we have come across families that haven't visited, uh, haven't seen a physician in years. And so the question is, am I healthy enough to get this vaccine? Mm -hmm. I don't have the resources to go to a doctor. I haven't seen a doctor five to six years. Wow. Um, so I don't know if I'm healthy enough. And that is a legitimate concern. And so what we're doing is inviting healthcare physicians to be at our vaccine events. And then we're calling them and letting them know that the physician will be inside in case they have any questions. I mean, that, that blows me away, Christina. That, yeah. that this is so much of a bigger issue here that's the hesitancy for vaccine has to do well beyond just the trust of the vaccine. Are you running into that as well? Yes, unfortunately, we've seen that this pandemic has really, you know, uh, shown more light on the health disparities and equities that were already existing. As you've clearly mentioned, we've got people who haven't been able to access the healthcare system for months and years. So this pandemic just exacerbated that, right? And so, um, again, meeting people where they are, doing events like what you're doing, which is amazing, um, having in-language services, which I think is just mm. it's so incredible. When you are able to speak to somebody in their native tongue, it makes much more of a difference than speaking to them in English, yeah. right? And so when we have someone who looks and sounds like them, it makes all the difference. Let's talk a little bit about the mix of, of policy here and what strategy is. And I, I wanna mention Clark County right now is looking at potentially doing a pilot where they're gonna give $100 uh, for a vaccination. I, I don't know if Moderna then would be 200 if you're doing both or, or exactly how they're gonna work that out. But <laughs> it is an interesting, we've seen incentivizing with money before. First off, do you think that's the right type of policy? Could that potentially close the gaps, especially in some of our disparate communities right now? So I think um, it's twofold, right? So in some instances, that may be enough to incentivize someone. Um, and I do think that, you know, that $100 could be the difference between somebody being able to pay their full rent and maybe not being able to uh, pay partial rent, especially as we're now seeing uh, evictions, even though the moratorium was extended. That's definitely an issue. Yeah. Um, but I do see, especially in the black community, that it's actually turned people off. Mm. That it's like, why do you have to pay me? Why do you have to give me things? Like, is there something wrong with this vaccine? Why are you having to give me these things to make me get it, yeah. right? And so I think we have to be very careful. Um, and again, really being very mindful about answering people's questions because not everyone's uh, vaccine journey is the same and they may um, just have, you know, an instance where they just want their questions answered and really yeah. doing that, you know, boots on the ground, one-to-one -one answering questions and having somebody that they, that they like and that they trust to be able to, you know, to answer those questions. And so yeah. I just think it's super important for us to not really picture everyone with a broad brush because everyone's different. It could be because of lack of childcare. It could be because they're worried about feeling sick after and not being able to go to work, yeah. right? All of these things, especially if they don't have a primary care provider, who, who are they going to go see if they feel bad after they get the vaccine? So we, we have to address all of these concerns yeah. and we have to do it individually. Really, really great points. And you've already addressed how important it is, the outreach here and the education, you know, what we're doing. We've seen some of the gaps. We've seen some of the disparities we saw even a couple of weeks ago, particularly in the Hispanic community communities, black and African-American communities to close a little bit. What do you think is key there? I mean, is, is it just that educational component? 
I think, uh, uh, and Christina, um, uh, exactly every community um, has different concerns. Um, and every community is going to react different to incentives, to messaging, right? And I think it's good that we, we try everything. Yeah. It's good that we try everything because we have to, um, yeah, because some of our communities don't have the luxury to take a day off. That means that they're losing um, income if they take the day off to go get vaccinated or um, to, you know, in, in case of a reaction, to call in sick or work. Yeah. So in, in my case, I feel that um, the $100 incentive is going to help them. It, it's, they, they see it more as, okay, well, I'll take the day off, $100 will we'll cover for that oh. loss of wage for the day. So would definitely uh, those type of incentives do help, you know, at least in our communities, because we are seeing that some of those concerns they have is the fact that they just don't have the time to go get vaccinated. Right. Even if it's within five miles of their home, you work in two to three jobs. Yeah. Great and, and great points all the way around. And I think what's really important here is the mix between policy and the outreach is really, really key here. Thank you so much to both of you. Well, of course, I want to thank our guests, Cecilia Alvarado with Mi Familia Vota and Christina Madison with Roseman University. Now, in an effort to combat some impacts of the pandemic, Congress passed the American Rescue Plan, which puts billions into Nevada's coffers. Now state leaders want to know where that money should be spent. But earlier this week, I spoke to Nevada State Treasurer Zach Conine about the listening tour he is on right now and to find out where Nevadans want to see that money spent. Treasurer Conine, thank you so much for joining us uh, again. Uh, we had you here virtually. It's so, so much of a pleasure to have you in person. Um, I wanted to get right into American Rescue Plan funding, and I say it that way because there's a lot in a name, and there is no recovery in this title. There is no relief in this title. So let's talk about what rescue, and then I think, of course, plan means here with respect to how this funding can be used in our state. So we see it at the state level as, frankly, an unprecedented opportunity to take on challenges and fix things that have been broken in Nevada since the 1860s. Hmm. Um, and can you, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? I mean, what, what exactly can the money be used for? Is this just kind of a free-for-all? Well, it's certainly not a free-for-all. It's money from the federal government, so it has plenty of rules attached to it. For instance, the $2.7 billion in state uh, and local relief funds. 2.7 is what we got in at the state level. 1.04 is what they got at the city and county levels. That has 150 pages of interim final rule, which by definition isn't the final rule. Uh, the information came out on how we could spend it on May 17th, and it has been revised about 12 times since then. Mm. Um, so it's deeply complicated. But we are focusing less on the complexities of the work and more on the opportunities of the work. And let's talk about those opportunities. And I think a, a very interesting part of this uh, discussion is these Nevada recoverers listening tours that are happening right now, 75 cities that you are uh, going to and towns, I should say, all across Nevada. What is the intended outcome of these listening sessions? We realized early on in this process that an unprecedented amount of money deserved an unprecedented response, that this decision shouldn't be made by just the governor, a few members of the legislature, myself and others sitting behind closed doors. Talking to the White House, talking to Federal Treasury, it is very clear that the intent of this money is to fix longstanding problems. And in order to identify longstanding problems, in order to identify the best ways to fix them, we had to go talk to every Nevadan. Now, we know some of those conversations are easier than others, right? There are some parts of the state that probably aren't super happy to see their government showing up and asking for input, but that's okay because we want to make sure we include every voice and every Nevada. And let's talk about, the, I'm, I'm assuming these listening sessions have started already? They have. We're in week two right now. Uh, we expect we're going to blow through 75 events. That was a target, uh, but we're two weeks in uh, of our call it 10 week tour. And we've already had uh, 25 or 26 events. Wow. And they range the gambit, right? Some of those are big rooms full of people with disparate ideas. Some of those are chambers of commerce or county commissions or city councils. Because one of the big focuses of this process is to make sure that the state is coordinated with local governments, yeah. with county governments. Because we know if we work together, the outcome is going to be much better than if we each go our own way. Yeah, and that's important to, to note is that this isn't just, these aren't just public listening sessions. We are talking to community-based agencies too. Let's talk about that coordination and how then you're going to collect all this information, this feedback you're getting, how you're going to aggregate 
things that can be as you know anecdotal as you know an individual's feedback and then how are you going to report that back to the public and to the agencies you're talking to right now so our focus is on creating the most transparent process possible and to that end all ideas that are going to get funded through this money go through NevadaRecovers.com. We've been collecting ideas for the last probably two months or so. Hundreds of ideas have come in so far. We expect by the end of this process we'll have thousands. And they range from, I'm a charitable organization, I provide, say, food, and if I had three more refrigerated trucks and an additional 40,000 square feet of warehouse space, I could serve this many more people, and the necessary population to serve is this big, and, and so I'd be closing that gap. We also have ideas that aren't baked. Right? Ideas from community members that say, I don't have access to health care. I can't get to a grocery store. Right? And the second part of this process, we're actually going to be able to resource those ideas for the first time and make them into plans. Gotcha. Uh, who's going to make the decisions ultimately on how this money is spent? Well, eventually, the decisions on spending, as always, go through the legislature. Uh, the governor and I and others are very involved in that process, but the legislature, through the Interim Finance Committee, will be making the final decision, which is why it's so important that the legislature, the governor, our office, and the rest work hand-in-hand -hand through this process to collect it, to make sure that they're not seeing uh, some sanitized report, right, that they are seeing literally the raw information that we're getting so that we can together synthesize it into a plan. And final question, we just have a few seconds left, but public engagement is a big part of this. How do you get engaged in one of these listening sessions as they come into your city or town? Everything goes through NevadaRecovers.com. So if you go to NevadaRecovers.com, you can sign up for future events. You can get involved, reach out. If you want us to host an event for your organization, just let us know. You can also take a survey, which gives us good qualitative information. And like I said, submit a specific idea. All of those ideas will get looked at. All of those ideas will get resourced. And together, we can build the Nevada we deserve. Treasurer Conine, thank you so much. Thanks Appreciate for it. having us. Like many community-based organizations in Southern Nevada, Vegas PBS is participating in state and local listening sessions and have requested related funding. Now, some of the federal money is already being used for rental assistance. Keeping people housed during the pandemic has been a big concern. The eviction moratorium in place for months expired at the end of July, but the CDC extended it a few days later. However, Questions remain about whether it applies to Nevada. Well, joining us to answer those questions is Enrique Acuna with the Legal Aid Center of Southern Nevada. Enrique, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. Glad to be here, Kip. Yeah. I mean, let's get right to it. As I just said in the intro right there, there's been a lot of debate around the CDC restrictions and whether they apply to Nevada. Do they? Well, uh, you know, different people could have different interpretations of the law. That is what creates uh, the legal field, and that's what allows people to stay uh, um, arguing within the legal process. Mm. Um, we believe generally that the CDC moratorium should apply throughout Nevada where, it do, where uh, infection rates meet the uh, infection rate level set by that latest moratorium. Mm. Um, there has been some pushback from some of the courts in Las Vegas stating that uh, um, the CDC moratorium does not apply because uh, Nevada has greater protections for tenants than, than what's present in the CDC moratorium. Again, it's a difference of opinion, um, and we're not sure if that uh, uh, opinion is going to stay as it is. Another um, judge in the Las Vegas Just Justice Court has given effect to the CDC moratorium in her courtroom. Hmm. So the, you know, just trying to delineate what's going to happen has become a little more muddled. Yeah. In our opinion, it should apply. Most judges in the Valley agree with us. Yeah. And that's such an interesting part of this too, right? Is that there's this balance of where the courts might, might, might see this and where this might end up in being challenged by courts all the way up to the Supreme level. And then of course the moratorium ending. But it sounds like, I mean, are you noticing uh, an increase in evictions um, related to this at all? Well, you know, we were expecting that there were gonna be a flood of evictions. Uh, the last CDC moratorium ended on July 31st. The new one was enacted on August 3rd, so there was a very short time period there before the new moratorium uh, was given effect. That may still be impacting the ability of, of evictions to, to happen. Um, we're, we're seeing a huge increase in people that we're helping through the Legal Aid Center, either through our, um, our main office, providing assistance to tenants that have questions, that need advice on how to 
move forward with their cases. Also at our self-help center, we have hundreds of people that we assist every month. And we assist both landlords and tenants in getting legal information about the process uh, that's available for them to either move forward with an eviction or fight it. And that's an important part, and I think a big shift here. Um, legislation, uh, our last legislative session, uh, uh, Assembly Bill 486 passed, which allowed landlords um, to be the ones to request this relief. So you, are you seeing more traffic and more guidance are you giving to, to landlords right now? And what are they saying? Well, I think, unfortunately, you know, uh, for the most part, when, when a, a landlord is uh, uh, reasonable and rational and, and is thinking about the bottom line, then it, it makes absolute sense that they would apply for uh, renter's assistance on behalf of their tenants. Yeah. Um, you know, we just had a, a couple people murdered uh, last week by a, a landlord who um, was so frustrated by not getting rent from his tenants that, you know, he took the law in his own, own hands. And so I think that's between a bigger issue, especially as we're going back and forth, you know, is the protection there, is it not there? There's some emotional turmoil that people are dealing with, and that makes it harder to get uh, the word out on what protections are available for tenants and landlords yeah. so that they could get access to that money to pay this back rent and to keep these people in their households. Yeah. That might be one of the assumptions here too, is that an extension on a moratorium, if we already have individuals that are at risk, have not paid rent for a month, that it, it might not just prolong the inevitable, that it might put them in a deeper hole. There could be more months of rent missed and things like that. The clients you're talking to or the concerns you have on maybe the clients you're not talking to, is this a big concern that the, the motor, moratorium could be then extending the risk and heightening the risk here? Well, the bottom line is, you know, we're seeing a resurgence of the Delta variant. So there is a public health concern in keeping people in their households. Yeah. But financially, there may be some impacts. Um, our, number one, uh, um, our number one advice to all tenants is apply for rental assistance. Number two, file CDC moratorium um, uh, documents with their landlord. If they get a notice, answer it um, and look for help. You know, we, we're here to help, we're, we're able to help them and we'll do so. Uh, we have multiple ways that we could help. We could uh, um, help in person by text message, uh, through chat feature, in person at the, uh, Clark, at the Regional Justice Center. Mm -hmm. And we're here to provide assistance to make this as easy as possible for people. It can be overwhelming. Again, things have been going back and forth so much that people don't really know what to believe or what's coming down the road yeah. legally. Yeah. Um, so we could help them clear up that uh, uh, confusion and help them understand exactly what steps they need to take to protect themselves and their family from eviction. But uh, there's still, tens of millions of dollars available in rental assistance, and that's gotta be the first part of solving this problem, yep. using that federal money to uh, pay back rent. And, and you know, it's, we need it for the economy. The, 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 the landlords need that money so that, that we can keep our economy moving and growing. Now, when the vaccines arrived and COVID case numbers started to trend down, weddings returned and the wedding capital of the world reaped the rewards. The Nevada Week team checked out one of Las Vegas's wedding chapels. Weddings are back in Las Vegas. Please give your, your gorgeous wife and kids. New Yorkers Crystal and Gavin Foster picked Las Vegas as their wedding spot. Honestly, I chose it. He didn't have a choice. <laughs> it's the wedding capital of the world. How could you go wrong? A few friends and family joined them to celebrate. And my cousin right there actually booked her flight the day before. <laughs> and just came on out to support us. Thank you guys. 2021 is a much different year for weddings than last year. Like just about everything else, 2020 was tough for wedding venues and vendors. With limits on capacity and concerns about COVID-19, many couples either put off their nuptials or got married but moved their big party to this year. It's been really, really fun because we're just seeing all the brand new couples who have quarantined together. So it, they're still really fresh, but they've gone through so much already. We're seeing a lot of like mature couples who are still very new to each other, but the way that they've experienced each other and the world is a totally different new perspective. So it's really, really fun to get them married and hear their stories. Christina Banks is a wedding planner for Vegas Weddings in downtown Las Vegas. 
She spent 2020 figuring out options for couples in a world dominated by the pandemic. Obviously there's high stress situations, but at the end of the day, you tell us what you need. We're full service, we're gonna make it happen. Now that the domestic wedding biz has mostly returned to normal, Banks is getting ready for a tidal wave of international clients who are standing by for border restrictions to be lifted. We're waiting for that day because there's a flood coming in. <laughs> As for the newlyweds, Crystal and Gavin, their next stop is the post-wedding party. Party of those Vegas style. Yeah. <laughs> for Nevada Week, I'm Natalie Cullen. Well, thanks, Natalie. And thank you, as always, for joining us this week on Nevada Week. Now, for any of the resources discussed on this show, please visit our website at vegaspbs.org slash Nevada Week. You can also find us on social media at Nevada Week. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.